All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are live today with uh, Christine Norville. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. And uh, Christine is one of our literature teachers. She's offering two courses in the fall, which you can see uh, listed on the, on the banner below, World Literature and American Literature. And uh, we actually wanted to talk today about, well, just reading, reading books, how to read, uh, what makes good books even we might tackle. Uh, <laughs> be before we do that, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found Kepler. Sure. Actually, um, I went back to school to get my master's um, primarily because I taught in a classical school for a couple of years. We were adding curriculum and building a high school grade by grade. And I felt this great deficit in my own knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's such a homeschooling parent story, though. <laughs> Isn't it? I know. And so um, I was looking around at various schools, and um, one of my administrators had looked at a graduate program at Faulkner University, and they were just beginning um, a graduate program geared toward classical teachers who were looking um, for a master's and eventually a PhD program. And so I rambled around in there for a while and it took about three and a half years to complete my master's, but I was able to read and learn a lot of the things I needed to teach and get feedback and do a lot of the research with my graduate coursework. At the same time I was teaching high schoolers the same subject. So it was, oh, it was a great parallel and super handy for me, but um, as I was finishing my degree, uh, Scott Postma was beginning his PhD. And so we overlapped um, a couple of classes, I believe, and then just stayed in touch. And then he had a website and was teaching online high school classes and asked, asked me now and then to contribute an article to his website. And we've just mm -hmm. stayed in touch over the last number of years. And so when this venture came about, um, I heard about it in August. Um, I was like, oh, keep me in the loop. Email yeah. me. I'm really curious about this. Okay. So for those who are not in the know, Scott Postma is the president at Kepler and, and also a teacher. Um, so I'm just really curious, what was his sales pitch? <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe efficient teaching. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> as in, um, it actually saves time. Yeah. Um, when you're not on a physical campus and um, have added on meetings and duties and things like that, but really just getting to teach and work with a small group of students and really individualize it. And um, I was looking to have more time at home um, for the projects I'm writing. And um, this just came along at the perfect moment. Nice. I mean, one, one of the things I'm like, I, I worked as an independent teacher for for most of my career, uh, and uh, you know the the how, Kepler is attractive to teachers, not just students. Like there, there are a lot of yes. great schools out there, and the and you know the teachers like to work at. Um, everything is oriented toward the students, and uh, I, I kind of like how Kepler manages to be oriented both ways. Yes, I so. agree. I think it's a win-win, and I I can't wait to jump in. All right, with world literature and American literature. So I've been looking at this uh, this uh, reading list for uh, for world literature, and I, w I want to get into some specifics a little later on. But uh, it's just a fascinating reading list: Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, Mary Shelley. Um, so I'm curious to know, given the diversity of, I mean, there's Moliere here. What kind of reader are you? Oh. <laughs> 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 That's like a deep end question, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of latitude. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think that each of us have um, an a range of personalities when it comes to reading and also to learning, because we like to read um, from different types of material. I might like to. Um, browse a magazine that comes in the mail. And at the same time, I might read an essay by C.S. Lewis, or I might also be teaching uh, Macbeth again, and I'm rereading along with my class. So 
I have multiple things going at <laughs> any given any time. Any given time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, I mean, th that, that is kind of a classic model of, of reader, like the juggler, if yes. you will. Right. Um, but then, so w w when you approach a book, like a particular book, how do you approach it? That is where the perspective comes in that I know I didn't quite learn when I was going through school. Okay. And that's really the heart of my message as a teacher when I want to help students become better readers is I feel that there were, I mean, especially in retrospect, we can all look back and see where we didn't quite get <laughs> what we had hoped for Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as far as our ability to learn and to inspire us and to actually have the want to or the eagerness to learn from what we were reading. And um, that's when I find uh, really every bit of C.S. Lewis's experiment and criticism to be so helpful because he uh, talks about things in such a simple and yet deep manner. I mean, there are layers to what he says, but the first time I read uh, his comparison about how we read and described it as you either use literature or poetry. I think he was specifically talking about poetry in this chapter or you receive it. And um, I, I mean, he caught my attention. I'm like, use it. <laughs> if you, I mean, we can use a hammer. I can fix a shingle in my roof or um if I know someone really unkind, they might use and manipulate me. And that can be a negative thing. It's like, what do you mean with those simple three letter word like use? And by use, he meant, um, it's almost like the literature uses you. you. You don't really know anything. It just happens to you. And many teachers um, really accidentally and probably unconsciously because they hadn't thought about it, actually use literature. And that's where it is so analytical. You practically beat the thing to death to bring meaning to it. And students are so frustrated by having to learn terminology and examples and figure out what every sentence means or every line of poetry means that then they, they cannot stand it. Right. <laughs> And um, I think that's what Lewis was getting to. So I have this distinct memory in eighth grade reading Lord of the Flies with Mr. Lee. And it might be a short book. And it was, you know, a war commentary from 1954 on the effect of war upon this group of boys that stranded on this, this island. And I mean, now I look at that story in an entirely different way. But when I was 13... I was shocked by the violence and I didn't know uh, mankind could be this mean <laughs> and, and cruel. Um, there's so many murders. It's, it's really an awful story about human nature, but my teacher uh, like explained it away. He would define words. He would explain a British mannerism or what could be referred to that we wouldn't know as American students. Um, but he just chopped that thing in so many pieces by the time we were done. I don't think I learned anything. I just remembered the shock of the story more than right. anything else. And I was so glad it was done because I was like, well, obviously I'm not yeah. intelligent enough to understand this thing without <laughs> him pulling it apart. Right, and one, that's that's what that's one of the things that 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 teachers will do that that can really be destruct, destructive. Not, I mean, it's obviously destructive to the piece of literature itself. But then, mm -hmm. as you're building the mind of the young reader to teach them that the way to read deeply is to pluck it apart into pieces and go around naming the parts as if that were somehow, you know, the, I mean, the very term de deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Right. It is. I mean, this is indicative of of this using way of, of reading. But mm -hmm. what's so what, what does a receiver, what does someone who's receiving a work do? Like, how, how is that? How is that different? Yeah. And this now this this is interesting because Lewis is very thorough. <laughs> and if you reread this entire book and he explores literary theory, he addresses critics. And he really, <laughs> he's basically like, give, 
the critics the boot. Who cares about that? <laughs> you come to your own reading and decide what yes. you think it means. Okay. But um, it's part of uh, it's part of this idea. I mean, very simply, Lewis said everyone comes to reading with their own point of view. Um, they see the whole world with their own point of view, and you need to be aware of that. I mean, that is not a complicated thought, but I cannot for the life of me recall a single teacher saying to me, be aware that each of us have a different point of view when we're reading the same words and that it could affect how we listen and learn from it. And um, Lewis calls it like a, a selectiveness that's peculiar to each person. Yes. Well, you know, I, I think that there's... Um... There's a sense in which we can struggle with that as, as Christian educators. I mean, you, you said it's a, it's a pretty simple expression, a pretty simple thought. And mm -hmm. it is, but it's challenging for us because we recognize that relativism, deconstruction, I mean, th that's no good. Mm -hmm. But then if we're supposed to accept a piece of literature on its own terms, right? If it's supposed to, if, 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 it's, if it builds, it, you know, the, if, if you're entering the story, Right, it has come from a certain perspective, and I don't want to use the term worldview with this, but you know, you, there's a world that's been created, right? Mm -hmm. You've entered this world, and to, to appreciate the work for what it is, you have to accept the laws of that world as they are, as long as you're in the peace. And we think that we're surrendering the ability to be critical when we're right. not. The only way to be, truly be critical is to be able to accept it, to have taken the piece as it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And then once we do that, when we're, when we're done with the experience, we can then say, okay, well, that was a fabulous meal. That was a terrible meal. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that delighted you. I am, I'm assuming that that's no, uh, I delighted laughter. <laughs> we are all eager to eat out again, aren't we? <laughs> oh man, goodness, yes. <laughs> I had I had McDonald's for lunch, and I was thinking as you were talking about the little parts of uh, you know breaking literature apart. I was just thinking about how I I, I did the hamburger a disservice by eating that Big Mac because you mm -hmm. know a, a hamburger can be amazing. But uh, yeah, Big Mac just feels like a bunch of constituent parts thrown together and then called a hamburger. <laughs> anyway, uh, Cooper so Salmon. Relevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll make it relevant. Uh, uh, Cooper Salmon uh, says this reminds him of Walker Percy's thoughts on being so analytical about a book that students lose sight of, of the book entirely. Right. And I mean, Lewis, of course, since he writes a book about this practically, he talks about. Um, the Greek words poema and logos, and most everyone's familiar with them. With, but when he's talking about literature or poetry or anything actually an artist produces, um, poema is this something made by the poet or the author. And that leads us to look at this creation. It doesn't lead us to look at the poet. We're not supposed to be, you know, all hailed. <laughs> All hail uh, this obsessive idol, this poet, author, artist. Mm -hmm. It's it's not about that. It's that they are leading us to something that we can see in their creation, and they lead us through the words that they use, the the logos, the something said. So um, those things together, if we can see them, can actually help us understand what the author intended. And you don't need. Uh, necessarily a label on a literary theory or all these different categories of thoughts, um, it actually can be much more simplistic mm -hmm. when we try to receive from from what we're reading. Uh, have you ever read any Billy Collins? He's a poet. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> so you might already have, have a certain poem of his in mind, but I, I brought up a poem he wrote called Introduction to Poetry, which mm -hmm. if you'll allow me, I'll read to you. Yes, please. <laughs> I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. 
but all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love that. But you know, what you were saying kind of kind of put me in mind of, of that poem that, that we, you know, we beat uh, we beat these these things to death to find out what we can extract from it. Right. Uh, instead of instead of actually participating in the work of art as it, as it was meant to be participated in. So this yeah. I, I, I want to wade out of 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 our waters. Okay. Um, into waters we do not belong in. Let's talk some theology. How does what you're talking about uh, touch on the doctrine of revelation? Like on God's revelation. Mm -hmm. This actually goes back to me to receiving from the words that you're reading or hearing, um, whether it be scripture, a hymn, a poem, a story, because our minds, the way God has created us, do receive in different ways. But um, if we're receiving, many times it's through impressions. It's through our discernment, if we're even aware of that. And that's how many times understanding comes to both our mind and heart. And uh, things that are of a revelatory nature are many times those deep things um, and Lewis says, you know, listen, if you're reading or you're listening, it's worth using all of your attention. If you think you found something worthwhile, well, then use all of your attention, even if it's to find out that that thing wasn't worth paying attention to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's say we find out that a thing wasn't worth paying attention to, or mm -hmm. we find out that it's delightful, whatever. Yeah. So how, how with, with this you know, in in, in 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 thinking of how we read books and how we read great books in a receptive way, mm -hmm. how does that? How do you teach students to be critical readers? Okay, <laughs> that's like uh -oh. that, take, that takes a whole school year. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how many minutes do I have? No. Um, to be a critical reader is really a habit that has to be trained. And it's one of those things that it depends upon the type of reading that you're doing. Are you doing it for the purpose of entertainment and pleasure and escape? Are you doing it because uh, you enjoy beautiful prose and, and you look forward to reading something of beauty that inspires you? Or, you know, are you doing it for the purpose of study? All of those things, those purposes affect, of course, um, how our critical attention is focused. But many times, I, I mean, even when I teach poetry, I start off by telling the students, we're not going to review terms. Uh, we're not going to talk about literary devices right now. Let's just read this and just listen. Hmm. And then... I'll ask them, okay, what did you think of it? There's always a few that want to start showing off their head knowledge <laughs> and say, oh, Mrs. Norville, that was like three similes in a row. <laughs> no, that, that wasn't the question. <laughs> the question was, what effect did it have on you? What did it make you, made you think of? And then when you have a room full, 10, 20, 30 students, you have many different versions that might hinge on the same theme. And then we have something we can discuss. And then I can say, okay, so you think you know what it means, right? <laughs> like, let's read it again and listen again. And then if a, a terminology um, that we would use to talk about the structure of the poem, if that comes up and the class might agree upon it, then we'll continue to talk about it. But that critical reading, I mean, you have to read so many things more than once. I mean, yeah. that honestly is it. Whether it's a paragraph you're stumbling on and I have to pull out for myself my index card and I go line by line to help me focus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I have to stop and look up a word because that one word is hampering me understanding an entire page. Um, there's a lot of those habits in critical reading. Um, that are they just happen in the classroom and at home as you go day by day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, the same essay that Lewis talks about 
uh, you know, receptive versus, you know, using. He, he, he also talks about how you know, the best way to, to know if something is good or bad is to have read a bunch of really good <laughs> books. Right. right? Uh, <laughs> I, I think the image is that you know, the, the best way to know when you know someone dishonest is trying to trying to you know to know to avoid untrustworthy people is to have lots of honest and trustworthy friends. Yes. Not to be highly skeptical. And that's the tendency in criticism, right? Is to be is to always be skeptical and to see to mm -hmm. see if this thing I'm reading can can reach these standards that I'm setting for it. Right. That's true. Uh, let's see here. I'm uh, getting in some comments here. So Daniel put in a, a, a very long poem, Daniel Fukushan, but I realize now a very long comment. He put in <laughs> the entirety of Introduction to Poetry, that, that, that poem. <laughs> so Daniel says, yes, regarding the importance of reading more than once, the signs of a great book is that every subsequent reading is more profound than the last. And it doesn't even have to be more profound, I would say. I think, you know, if I, if I come to something, if I read Lord of the Flies when I was 13 and had no idea what I was doing other than surviving language arts, <laughs> yeah. and then I read it again at 18 and 30 and now at 50, it's going to mean something entirely different to me. I don't know that that always means it's more profound or right. it means that I am a more mature reader. And so I can see more of what the author was aiming for, or personally, it might mean more to me because I can see that this author meant, <laughs> missed his opportunity uh -huh. to, yeah. show, <laughs> to show us <laughs> that there could be a redeeming factor. That man does have a choice if he's aware that God exists and that there's more to help us in this life than maybe a, a naval captain that happens upon a burning island at the end of the story <laughs> to yeah. rescue boys who've gone too far. You know, um, it's interesting that the adult rescues that comes in as the rescuer at the end. Um, but I mean, those types of things and the modernism in the 20th century, uh, you can see those patterns and the older you get and the more you reread those types of things, uh, they come really easily. And yeah. we just have to remember with grace that many times our students are reading these poems, these stories for the very first time. And that as teachers, we have to be mindful of that and even tell, a, tell ourselves that, okay, if I were reading it for the first time, what would I notice even before we assign it to our students? Because I think that helps um, simplify things mm -hmm. also so that we don't say too much too soon. Right. No, you know, that <laughs> that is a bigger trap that I think a lot of a lot of people realize that teachers have to deal with is uh, is uh, I guess managing the flow. I don't even know exactly, but you know, it's it, right. it is a real yeah, you, know, you don't want to crank open the fire hose and <laughs> I I know, and we're all capable of yeah, it. Man, and many sure. of us have sat under teachers that they were a fount of knowledge, but it wasn't the good kind. Yeah. It, it was yeah. just, <laughs> you know, the volcano spew where it's just, I'm amazing. I know all of this. And it didn't exactly help you learn. Um, right. Yeah, there's something to the virtue of humility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, uh, re regarding the the reading <laughs> lots of good books to know what good books are, Cooper Salmon had a very colorful image. Uh, it oh, says yes. counterfeit bills, right? It, you look at real bills to know what's fake, not looking at other fakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, I'm looking here at uh, at your your world literature. Uh, course, so it's from it. It goes from fifteen hundred to nineteen hundred, and there's a, you know there's there's Marlowe, uh, there's uh, there's Shakespeare, there's Dickens, there's Tolstoy and Camus. Um, it's a it's a very it, it, more than many other classes. It's a varied list, um, and a, a lot of honestly like kind of shorter pieces as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. What, what 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 what's the thinking behind this list? Is there some great theme running through it, <laughs> or is it just I just, I just want to show people all these wonderful things? What what's the thinking? Yeah, I only picked books that I'm good at. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> so, not, everything's explained. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, um, I've actually taught every single one of these um, more than once. And um, I did start with a much longer list. And then I realized, you know what? Um, even though everything on my long list is worth studying and would be considered a classic and something with great value to it for whichever country it represents, does that mean if we study more that we'll actually get more from it? And I don't know, the more I thought about the fact that, you know, likely I'll just meet once a week for a two hour chat with my students. I didn't want to overwhelm them with 50 and 100 pages of reading necessarily, but um, more about the quality versus quantity mm. argument. And so I really chose um, the essays, um, a few poems, several plays, just a variety of genres from, I think, about, um, I haven't counted it, but I think four countries. And um, wanted to be representative in a way that would give us plenty to reflect on without overtiring anyone or overwhelming anyone necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, my classes are open for 10th, 11th, or 12th graders. And um, a 10th grader will read um, Camus <laughs> differently than a 12th grader will. Um, but we need time to read through it and not to push the pace too hard so that we have time to think about it. Yeah. And so actually, you know, this, this, this thought of, of pacing and needing time mm -hmm. and it connects to a, a, a question that's been asked here. How do you foster, and foster was the word that connected to, to time for me. How do you foster that initial joy of discovery? And this kind of touches on what we were talking about just a moment ago. Is there a danger of a teacher being almost too eager or too excited for a student <laughs> to get it? But I, I, I'd, 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 I'd love it if you focus especially, I mean, the whole question, but then uh, I'd, I'd really like to hear at length uh, about fostering <laughs> that initial joy. Well, it's sort of funny because I have these memories. Uh, when I first graduated from college, I was 21 and teaching 17 year olds. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. In public high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is what <laughs> happens, isn't it? <laughs> and it was, here's the textbook. It was American literature. You need to cover at least this much in one semester. Good luck. Yeah. And um, there weren't a lot of instructions. I was familiar with a lot of it. And I'm sure I had absolutely <laughs> no passion. <laughs> Those first few years I taught that material because I'm sure my eyes looked, you know, glazed over mm -hmm. <laughs> the deer in the headlight look because it was, it was too much and it was too new. And although I was eager to teach, I'm not sure it translated um, to my students yet before things settled in. Mm. And um, I, I think it took a number of years for me to get to that point where I realized that if I really feel called to this, if I really feel that God has me present in these lives in front of me for a reason, what will my relationship with them look like mm. in the classroom and without, of course, but in the classroom, um, because I love, I love what I'm reading and what I'm teaching. Um, I understand Daniel's comment because uh, I have been accused of that a few times of uh, Mrs. Norville. Are you ever not excited about <laughs> what we're about to read? And I'm like, was that a bad thing? You know, <laughs> so I really hit home, huh? Uh, yeah, I know it's so, funny. So, so is, but is that a real danger? I don't know if I would call it a danger. I would say that the students are so used to it that they don't come fresh in their approach. Sure. That almost takes you calling them to attention. Like, so it took three weeks to um, read Tartuffe. And um, before we start the new piece of work, whichever it is, a novel or another play, I often take the time to tell my students, I don't want to tell you everything about the author. I don't want to sway your opinion in the historical period alone. I want you to come 
with a fresh outlook. And um, I'm trying to remember the phrase that C.S. Lewis used. He talked about, um, not just our attention, which we, we already um, referenced, but also coming to something, a new piece with goodwill. Mm. He says something like, empty our minds and come to it with goodwill. Because if you come to a piece with a negative attention, yes, that's exactly what you're going to get out of it. You're going to see the negative critical things instead of the good that's there, even if you don't like something um, that you read. And so um, many times if I just paused with my classes and just said, Let's come to this new and fresh without me telling you anything about it. Let's just start reading for a couple of days. And then I might tell you about the author or you can look them up. Right. Um, and let's just come to the piece in a fresh way. Yeah. You know, it, it's easier when you do that to, to read a piece for what it's meant to do. Mm -hmm. Right. It would be uncharitable to read a nursery rhyme as if it were supposed to be some great sonnet. Mm -hmm. Right. It can be a great nursery rhyme, and, and it's on that basis that it should be appreciated. Right. So we've got uh, we've got this world literature class, and then we've got uh, American literature. The reading list there seems tighter. Mm -hmm. um, does it seem that way because we're just dealing with a shorter time frame? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we are. I mean, American literature is so new on the scene yet. So, I mean, yes, you can start uh, with Puritan literature and sermons and essays and such from the mid to late 1600s. Um, many students already have a lot of knowledge of that if they've studied colonial period and pilgrims and Puritans and things. Um, so I just jump into the 1800s. Mm hmm yeah, so hey, we see Longfellow here. I just bought uh, a collection of of Longfellow for uh, for my daughter, who was she was excited to begin exploring because anyway, I, I don't know how he came up. But she got really excited without having read any of it. Then so I was okay. to get her get her a book. Um, and it, Daniel just just dropped a comment about how uh, how Wes Callahan has expressed his envy of students who are coming to the Iliad for the first time. Mm -hmm. and experiencing something he'll never get to experience again. Yes. Um, are there things like that, maybe particularly in American literature, um, where you just, you know, you, you've, you've had the thought, or you've uh, maybe a little envy of the student who's seeing it for the first time, or you wish you could go back? Probably. Okay. I've never thought of that before, actually. Um, what, one of the unique traits of American literature, because it's so young, is... We have this gorgeous prose and poetry and the Romantic era as we were following the model of the British. Um, <clears throat> and then as we switch into post-war, post-Civil War, and then World War I and World War II, those points of view um, and uh, the malaise of modernism, as a lot of people uh, call it in that cliché, are so clear, a lot of stories are really distasteful. Um, mm -hmm. Novels, plays, I think of Death of a Salesman. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah, they are not well, the happiest stories, but the question is, is there still worth their value to them? So would I give anything to reread something in that 200 year period? I, I would have to say I am a, absolute super fan of Willa Cather. Mm. And if I had to pick between one of the romantics, I'd probably pick like Washington Irving or Willa Cather. Um, I would give anything to read Oh Pioneers again for the first time because I am a sucker for a gorgeous landscape and Irving does the same. Uh, it, it just when he lends himself to setting and begins to tell you in 20 pages what Sleepy Hollow looks like. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Or Willie Cather says, look at the small town in Nebraska and look at the, the fields that go to the edge of the horizon and the color and the wind and the sun and the bareness and yet the beauty that's there. I am just captured by that more than anything else. Yeah. So, uh, I, I want to kind of go off on a tangent with a, a word you <laughs> used uh, a, a little uh, so you said distasteful, describing some uh, some <laughs> literature. 
And I was, I was kind of glancing at the list, and, and Flannery O'Connor jumped out at me when you said distasteful. I wonder because so, so you have some short stories of hers in your in your reading list. Mm -hmm. What's the? I mean, is there a distinction you would draw between distasteful uh, and discomforting? Like, yeah, yeah I'll leave it there. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with that distinction. Uh, and what's really unique is just two weeks ago, I was teaching my 18 year old um, pieces from Flannery O'Connor. We read a few of her letters and a handful of her short stories and he truly had never read her before. Mm. And so I insisted on reading aloud with him and we just sat and read the story uh, as a story a day for three days. And <laughs> Oh my goodness. His reaction was visceral. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, <laughs> now, I mean, I hate to say this even as a teacher, but he really disliked Edgar Allan Poe and he really disliked Flannery O'Connor. Hmm. And um, so I, I came at it from, I mean, you can't take that personally. That, no, that, right. that was his perspective and his reflection. And he's just like, this is crazy stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, so why do people keep reading Flannery O'Connor? Let's talk through a couple of the spiritual themes. Mm -hmm. Can you see this? Tell me what you notice about this. And just trying to lead him one-on-one -on -one in a discussion without me personally being offended. <laughs> <laughs> and just say, what can you see? You know, and knowing not to push it too far because yeah. it's his first time with something um, that sets you um, in the sort of state of unease. Like you don't quite know what to do with it. Right. And now, now we're on Brave New World. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a brave woman. <laughs> he's, he's just like, i a mom. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. I know. That sounds, know. Like, that sounds like a blast. <laughs> um, so now, guys, is a great time as we, we kind of approach the uh, the end of this live stream uh, to submit any questions or comments you might have. And uh, Scott Postma has piped up with a, an easy, an easy question for you to handle. First, though, oh, hold on a second. Kyle Rappenchuk says hello. Hey, hi, hey. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Scott Postma's question should be easy for you to answer. I really consider this sort of a slam dunk. Which work? is really or really is the great american novel <laughs> hmm. yeah you know what I don't, I don't i don't think you should give any specific answer. you know i just won't touch that pbs tried for an entire year to pick the great american read scott <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't really come up with one <laughs> so clearly clearly you guys have worked together before and been together before because that's oh. the first level trolling from our president oh. thank you thank you mr postma <laughs> but I, there is one I would pick if I had to, if you force my hand. Ooh, yeah, do it, do it. And it's not unusual for any reason at all. But when I read it as a kid and I read it as an adult and in college and uh, taught it to some of an eighth grade, mm -hmm. undoubtedly it would be To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay. You just said undoubtedly. So it was a slam dunk and all along you had the answer. Well, you know, mockingbird. Okay. there's so many flavors of literature and so many genres. It's hard. It's yeah. really, it's an it unfair is. question. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you read uh, Harper Lee's? Uh, Go second? set a watchman. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did you? I, I did. haven't read it. What did you think? You know, I, uh, it kept me thinking for a long time because I'm like, Scout is 20. She's a chain smoker. What's this all about? <laughs> but as she comes back to town, her hometown, you know, there is so much relevance to uh, if you go away and study abroad or you travel for a couple of years, or you go off to college and come back to your hometown and you recognize, oh, my parents are older. Oh, wait, I'm older. And life has shifted um, from um, childhood, from pubescence. It's just such a different take um, and such a different feel from To Kill a Mockingbird, of course. Um, very thoughtful. Um, I don't think it's like an amazing story, 
but it, it still intrigued me and I kept reading because I wanted to see where it was going, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. All right, well, uh, Kyle says, I was just having this conversation with a student the other day. Our nation has changed so much in just a few centuries, it seems hard to pick one that highlights the American spirit. Mm -hmm. Scarlet Letter, Huck Finn, Moby Dick, they all have merit. Uh, but he did follow that up with uh, approval of your <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, though, that if you, okay, uh, all of us know this who've taught teenagers, that the scarlet letter, your students will love or hate. No one's in the middle. Huck Finn, more students will like it, but there'll be a few naysayers who are like, what was the point of that long journey on the river? And then Moby Dick, <laughs> if you even buy, if you even try mm -hmm. um, to teach that with a teenager by its sheer length, I don't know if anyone under a certain age can appreciate it as well as we should, but um, even the best books have their critics. Even if you had to pick the best or the greatest, you'll still have critics. And I don't know if any group of readers can choose one thing. Yeah. So, um, Daniel would love to hear about Till We Have Faces, a reading companion published in 2017. Could you tell <laughs> us about that? Sure. Uh, actually, now published in 2020 with the second edition. Okay, nice. It just came out this month on April 10th. So um, it's, it's a unique story because I wasn't planning on writing study guides ever. And now I, I've got the bug, I might keep going. But I taught the novel Till We Have Faces to ninth graders about 12 years ago for the first time. <laughs> and it was interesting because the summer uh, before we were having a curriculum meeting, we were choosing what books to include in the ancient time period with our freshmen in high school. And someone said, oh, hey, C.S. Lewis's novel is set in this ancient time. Let's do that. And I was like, sure, I've never read it. <laughs> and so the first time I taught it, it was all new to me and my students together. Wow. And I realized really quickly by the fourth or fifth chapter that the spiritual layers were so deep, I was lost. And mm -hmm. uh, I was scrambling to find material. And uh, even just a week or two into the book, a, a few parents would tell me something in passing and go, oh, yeah, I try to read that book. I never got it. Um, or, oh, yeah, I didn't like that book. Yes. And I kept hearing that for years. And I kept learning as I taught it year by year and kept reading more commentary and um, trying to figure out, hey, is there any study guide out there that normal teachers and people new to Lewis could actually find that would be of any help at all and um after a while it just i i would say god just kept putting it in my mind and i couldn't let it go huh. and i knew i needed to write at least a paraphrase at least something to show this is what i've done with my students that proved helpful yeah well that's very cool mm -hmm. uh this is how scott postma feels about the republication or the, uh. the, the second edition <laughs> It's much longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, let's make this the, f the final question. The, the last thing we talk about. Um, Cooper loved Moby Dick in high school because he listened to it. What, uh, what's your opinion of audiobooks generally? And then your opinion of audiobooks in an academic setting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And Cooper, I want to know if you had a favorite narrator or if you switch narrators for every chapter just for the fun of it. Because there are favorites based on accents. I, 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 the way you asked that actually made me wonder if you're a LibriVox volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I will say nothing. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Go anyway. ahead. <laughs> I've been tempted many times to try it because I know I would love to do it myself. But um, this is what I know from just real life. Um, of my three boys, uh, my second and third had difficulties reading. And by difficulty, well, honestly, that's just what a standardized test would say. Mm. Honestly, they were right on par we got them tested at a school's request and things like that and found out they were right where they were supposed to be developmentally. There was nothing wrong 
just that there's this push many times in reading to accelerate quickly. And sometimes your brain isn't ready to do that. And we immediately, I'd say by third, fourth, and fifth grade, often would use audiobooks for the reading in the evenings. Just we would follow along with our finger on the page and listen as we go. And we would trade off. My husband and I would read aloud or we would listen to an audiobook because it was necessary. It was necessary to help focus. And then it might have taken more time to listen. Mm -hmm. But um, it kept our boys, you know, up with their class um, just so that they could be a part and stay stay on pace, I guess you could say. But in the actual um, classrooms, oh, I love playing snippets of Italian and French and Russian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that students can hear the original language. This is what Moliere really wrote in his rhyme in French. This is what Petrarch wrote his sonnets in in Italian and find a good dramatic reading. And because um, it's very lively and just gorgeous to listen to. <laughs> Yeah. 14 line sonnets are incredible in Italian. And then, you know, um, even to help students when they get tired of the same teacher day after day, sometimes it's nice just to listen to a story. So if I want to play um, a recording of The Raven from Edgar Allan Poe off of a YouTube performance, why not? Yeah. You know, just to give it variety and to keep us, you know, interested. Yeah, I can dig that. There's a, <laughs> there's a, I, I was trying to remember who. A Frenchman said this, and I was trying to find out very quickly on Google if it was Moliere, and I, and I wasn't able to find it quickly enough. But someone said that reading poetry in translation is like kissing through a handkerchief. Oh. Um, <laughs> so at, at least you're, you're, you're giving the students the chance to, to hear it, if not understand it, in the, uh, in the, in original, the original tongue. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, Kyle apparently also uh, teaches Till We Have Faces, and he has used your study guide to great profit. Oh, thank you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really grateful you were able to make the time to come uh, come visit with me and, and talk about your classes. Again, as, as the viewers can see below, these are the two courses uh, that she's offering in the fall, uh, World Literature and American Literature. And uh, please do visit the website Take a look at those reading lists that we've been talking about uh, for yourself. Um, these courses should be enriching and fun. Uh, thanks for being here again. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, thanks to everybody who's been commenting and, and, and contributing. I appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. All right. So long, all. <laughs>